What do you do when you learn that your spouse has progressive dementia, possibly Alzheimer's disease? Why, plan a 10,000 mile trip, of course. This is the brutally honest journal of Susan Straley, a reluctant caregiver that wanted to run for the hills. Thankfully, she took her husband, George, along. The journal began as a way to keep friends and family informed about the location and progress on their three-month trip around the United States. As the trip progressed, Susan debated about how open to be about the symptoms and what they were feeling. She was encouraged to tell it like it is because this journal would be very helpful to others dealing with spouses with dementia. Once home, Susan was encouraged to continue writing about their experiences. And now the story is two books. Ride along with Susan and George on their tricycle trip across the United States and be encouraged that you too can survive this journey, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Welcome to Fading Memories, a supportive podcast for those of us caring for a loved one with memory loss. So with me today is Susan Straley. She is the author of two books, Alzheimer's Trippin' with George, Diagnosis to Discovery in 10,000 Miles, and then Alzheimer Trippin' with George, The Journey Continues. Over the Bumps with Friends, Family, and Community Support. So thanks for being with me, Susan. Thank you, Jennifer. Thanks for having me. I started reading part of the second book, and then I got the first one in and thought, well, I should probably back up and read that, but life has been insane. So I haven't had yeah. time to read. <laughs> You're still a caregiver, aren't you? Yes, my mom lives in a memory care residence, which they're fantastic, okay. but we're dealing with some different health issues and her doctors seem to think I have nothing to do. They just call me up and say, we need to do this test today. Like, excuse me, oh. I don't anybody that's um, that free with their time. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sure as you know, you can't just pick them up and head to the doctor. You know, what might right. take us an hour and a half takes three hours with, with them. So is she in assisted living? Yeah, in a memory care Because usually uh, uh, my mom there was an in-house physician. But I suppose for the testing, you had to take them out? Yeah, they or don't have a there. physician in this one. Okay, like a visiting physician, I mean. Oh, and no, they don't have that either. That's very helpful. Um, that, would, that would be. I don't know any of them in our area that do. But, yeah, that's, oh. that's definitely something for people to look into. And what state are you in again? Um, that was in Wisconsin, yes. Okay. That was in Wisconsin when I was taking care of my mom. <laughs> care of my George, so I'm a resident of Florida. Okay. That's why I remembered Florida. So you got to take care of your mom too? Yeah. But I was I was just the financial caregiver and visiting her and when she got into memory care we moved her up closer to my sister who's more of a nurturing kind of person. <laughs> just necessary it's helpful when you've got somebody that fills that bill i yes. try really hard but she's so good at pushing every single one of my buttons oh wow <laughs> unfortunately yes yeah. yeah. so i have to learn how to not react to all the button pushing right it's it's a practice in not reacting to your instant emotion which you know, all your pet peeves and everything just, oh, can't react to that. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah, because it's yeah. not going to do anybody any good if you're getting upset with them over stuff they can't control. So, yeah, going to give yeah. yourself a a worse, worse outcome if you react negatively. Yes. So your book started with, you basically started keeping a journal of your Travels? Yes, yes. Um, in 2014, George was diagnosed with dementia, and I have always been one for freedom. And actually, when we got married and said our wedding vows, I said, if you get sick, I'm not going to hang around. <laughs> um, and, you know, we kind of laughed all the wedding vows even uh, because we've both been married before. We both knew that Sometimes things don't work out, and I, we were both very scared. And I had told them, if you get sick, if you start acting crazy, if you start getting mean to me, I'm not going to hang around. So when he got the diagnosis, 
I was really wondering, uh, am I going to stick through this? Am I going to be able to stick through this? And then the one big fear was the financial aspect. He was my husband. We had saved up money for retirement. But if he got in a nursing home, which is the normal trajectory for this disease, like what's going to happen then? What's going to happen to me if I survive him? Uh, so I was thinking about divorce and I mentioned it to him and he cried and said, wait until our 40th wedding anniversary, please. <laughs> so I started to plan a 40th wedding anniversary trip and we took a road trip then. So that was that. And that the beginning helpful. of the blog was to keep our family and friends informed about where we were and what we were up to. And so, for your, there. so for your 40th anniversary, you had planned this. Was it a cross-country type trip? Yeah, we we're going to go up and see. Uh, we live in Florida, so we were going up to visit family and friends in Wisconsin. And then we were going to go um, over to Idaho to a trike rally that's on a, on a beautiful trail in northern Idaho. They have it every year, and we had never been, and so we were just really excited to go to that. And then we just visited different bike trails along the way because we like to bike trip, bike, um, and visit different people. Yeah. And we ended up with a house sit in Colorado, which was cool, and stayed there for about three weeks. So how long did this 10,000-mile trip take? It, we spent three months on the road over, yeah. And what? About 100 uh, days. <laughs> That sounds, I could, there are days right now. I'm, I'm ready to hit, <laughs> yeah. hit the road and just yes. not come back. <laughs> uh, it was very therapeutic. <laughs> um, uh, so this road trip was in 2014 or 2015? Um, he was, di oh, I'm sorry. He was diagnosed in 2015. Um, we took the road trip in 2016. Um, left in may and got back in september yeah um and it was great it was we had a lot of fun um and as i was doing the blog keeping people informed you know i funny things would happen and i would just write about it his symptoms started increasing on the trip and i started talking a little bit about what we were experiencing and uh and as i went along people were encouraging me to to be open, to be open, and uh, that I would help a lot of people by being open and telling our story. So I continue to do so. I still continue to talk about dealing with surprises, incontinence, um, uh, just the silence, you know. Uh, he was my partner, my life partner, my friend, and um, there was no conversation anymore. We couldn't carry on a conversation with so, um, yeah, it was some of that. Going. So his dementia he, progressed fairly quickly then? Yes. Um, he was diagnosed with hydrocephalus, uh, neutral pressure hydrocephalus, which is a pooling of a fluid on the brain from the spinal fluid. It's not being reabsorbed. The normal circulation is the fluid goes up and then it's re reabsorbed back down. But his wasn't being reabsorbed back down. Um, and usually the uh, solution to that is putting a tap in the brain and draining the fluid. Uh, but uh, they did a spinal tap and it didn't improve his cognitive ability. So they decided not to proceed with that brain surgery. It would be too risky. We've been on this journey with my mom for close to 20 years. So I'm always fascinated oh, my gosh. oh yeah i'm i'm kind of done there are days when i'm done and oh. now we're dealing with she's got a growth next to one kidney that i believe is sending mixed signals to her brain because sometimes she feels the urge to use the restroom gotta go now and then when you get her in the bathroom she doesn't know why she's there which that's super frustrating and then just yeah. this week the care staff told me that she'd had an accident in the dining room and i'm like okay 
I mean, we I did buy the pull-ups just because it seemed like it was about the right time, but all that happened overnight. It's up until May, the beginning of May of this year, 2019, her physical self was fine. Her brain is <laughs> shot. Uh, I mean, her visual processing is terrible. So she's she watches her feet when she walks. Any change in terrain visually, like a puddle, wet pavement, if, um, shadows on the pavement, ugh, it's, it's like treacherous. Oh. Yeah, so... Wow. Um, I know I take her out for little adventures. We love, she loves, I go with her. <laughs> she loves to watch children. My sister and my niece, who is almost 14, they take her out. I'm not, I haven't probed as to what activities they do with her because they can't be too much different than what we do. But having the middle grandchild with her helps my mom too. So yeah. my daughter's almost 28. So she doesn't go with me. <laughs> Oh, 20 years. That, yeah, that was something, you know, when I heard stories like that, I was just like, I can't do this that long. I can't, I don't want to. <laughs> um, well, when I, I hear I'm people, very fortunate. <laughs> yeah, when I hear people say things like, well, I'm going to keep mom at home forever, or I'm going to keep my spouse at home, you know, I'm like, you need to really understand that this could be a decade. Longer, I mean, ugh. it's, you know, you yeah. don't really know how hard it is until they get into the later stages like my mom at this point. When I show up on Mondays to visit because of this, whatever, the, they have not told me what this growth is. They're worried about something else, which to me is far less of a problem than the one that seems to be causing issues. And I show up about well it's about two o'clock on a monday after a meeting and almost every time in the last four to six weeks she's been in a state of distress undress mm. very just it you oh it's like she opens the door and <sighs> the stress just like blasts oh. right out and i think it's because she's losing control over her bladder or feels like she's losing control because she always says you know well, I'm wet and I pick up her clothes and they're not wet so it's like Ugh, okay but she's feeling that so it's it's not easy uh -huh. and then it takes 20 minutes to get her redressed and shoes back on and reassured and calmed down and it's like you know if you're taking them somewhere it's 20 minutes extra you have to plan just to get out the door and then yeah. getting in and out of the car is a challenge for her because with the visual processing being shot if you know like we fling one foot over the threshold of the car and kind of scooch in or I have crappy knees so sometimes I you know turn my back to the seat sit down and then fling my feet in if she turns her back to the seat she doesn't know it's there so then it's like you know, it's like oh. sitting. It's like sitting without knowing if there's a chair behind you. It's uh, oh, that's scary. Yeah. yeah, and understanding that helps a lot, but you know, it's still like you just want to pick her up and fling her into the car. Yeah, you want to get it done because you have a life too. Yeah, that you like, want to get back to. Yeah, well, it's like could we stop with all this drama and troubles and stress? just so we can go to the park and watch kids. That's what you like to do. And I like to do things that make you happy. So can we get to that part, please? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's interesting. So that's why yeah. I was interested in talking to you. Cause I'm like, this gal traveled around the country with her husband. I have to hear more. <laughs> <laughs> Cause he was in the earlier stages. And that's one thing I saw on your website that you had a 36 hour day. And I, uh, that was one of the first books that I was recommended to read. And I picked that up and started reading it and going, he doesn't follow this pattern at all. They're saying this symptom, this symptom, this symptom in the early stages. It's like he's way down here in some places and way up here in others. And it just, uh, he didn't follow the pattern. So um, I got frustrated with this book and never finished it. <laughs> I find um, it kind of 
not depressing, but it's definitely yeah. not uplifting. The one that I like is Dementia with Dignity. And I talked to her, and unfortunately her name's going to slip my mind. I think it was yeah. Cornish is the last name. Um, I think. <laughs> I talked to I a lot of people. I heard that creating moments of joy is also a really good. I'll have uh, to check into that one. Uplifting book because it's focusing on those moments of joy you're trying to create for your mom by putting her out in the in the park. And maybe there's something closer to home that you wouldn't have to put her in a car for. Uh, and I really would check with the staff and see if there's anybody out there that visiting doctor physician because that just just makes sense, doesn't it? Yeah, that there would be a physician that would visit nursing homes for people with memory loss or uh, mobility. Um, well, we, it was interesting because she had, through her health insurance, because what she has health insurance, Queen of England couldn't afford. Um, she's extremely mm. lucky that way. So are we. Yeah. She, through her insurance, she gets an annual, like home visit. And so this nurse practitioner came on a Monday afternoon and did all the basics, blood pressure, height, weight, talked to her, which is kind of mm -hmm. funny. And just kind of the general, I kind of like make sure you're breathing. kind of deal. <laughs> And the very next day, the staff was telling me they thought mom had a bladder infection. And that's, we've gone from, this nurse practitioner thinking everything was great to, you know, this growth next oh. to her kidney that they would like me to do a third ultrasound on. I'm like, please. The doctor wasn't happy when oh. I told him, uh, I'm out of town right now, which you knew. And when I get back, I don't have half a day to, to, to devote to, devote, devote to yeah. doing this ultrasound. And he's like, oh, well, it won't take that long. I'm like, you don't have a clue, buddy. <laughs> yeah. He's a younger doctor, and I'm educating him on what it's like to be a caregiver for someone with Alzheimer's because it's not easy. You know, she's at the stage where she uses mostly the wrong words, and she sometimes knows it, so she gets frustrated and just stops talking. So that doesn't help doctors. And they'll ask her questions, and she'll just randomly answer with something. And then I have to say, oh, yeah, that's fiction, whatever. It's like... I feel bad because it's like, nope, that's baloney. <laughs> nope, nope, oh, yeah. no, no, uh-uh. Yeah. <laughs> it's just like, I feel like the negative Nelly over in the corner going, nope, nope, that's a lie. Eh, nope, nope, fake, nope, nope. <laughs> it's like, that was frustrating, too, when my mom was in a home and a visiting doctor would come, but he'd be asking her questions. He wouldn't even let her, he know when he was going to be visiting, so I wouldn't even be there. Oh. He'd just go and ask her questions and accept those answers. So on her record was false information because she, she didn't remember she had heart problems. She did <laughs> so, The thing that yeah, kills me, and I, I'm an advocate with the Alzheimer's Association, I'm a legislative advocate part. On, I'm on the legislative advocacy team there. That's okay. the proper way to call it. And it frustrates me that, and I don't know if this just, because nobody's ever thought of it or HIPAA violations, but it's like, when you open my mother's chart, it should be right there. Advanced Alzheimer's. Because mm -hmm. I tell Talk to them, your daughter. <laughs> yeah. Well, and it just, but we went for a blood test and I explained to the gal, we checked in and I, and there was nobody in the waiting room. So I'm like, Oh, this is good. We won't have to wait. And I just said, you know, I'm just letting you know, my mom does not wait patiently. She has advanced Alzheimer's. She does not wait patiently. You know, we can go outside or something if there's a delay. And she just kind of looked at me like, whatever. And oh, we didn't, wow. we didn't wait. I'm not sure she, she was very young. I'm not sure. I'm not sure it clicked in her mind what I was trying to tell her. Cause I try to be a little bit discreet. Although my mom thinks I'm her best friend. So if I say mom, blah, blah, blah. She doesn't realize I'm talking about her. So that does help somewhat. Yeah. But I do try to be a little bit, you know, polite and discreet about talking about her, especially when she's standing right there. So we go into the blood draw room. The gal, you know, tells her, well, you could go sit over there. And my mom's like, 
looking around like, what, where, huh, huh? And it's like, there's only one place to sit in this whole room. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, well, this girl's going to get a little education. I'll just stand here and, and make sure it doesn't go off the rails. And then she looks at my mom and says, now, can you tell me your first and last name and your date of birth? I'm like, man, I barely understood that. And I just said, no, she can't. And the girl looked at me and I'm like, when you have advanced Alzheimer's, you don't want to ask people questions like that. She's like, well, I, I have to make sure that we're treating the right patient. I'm like, that's why I'm here. So I didn't come here for fun. <laughs> you know, and they just look at me like, like I'm the worst person, but I, I've tried really hard not to let my mom lose it with these people because they don't want to deal with that either. Unfortunately, that's not something she does, but you don't want to get her frustrated because then mm -hmm. she's not cooperative. Is so, this a woman in our, um, our county, Debbie Sell Savage? I don't know if you've met her, but she, um, she educates business people and businesses and their staff to be dementia friendly. So she goes in and she teaches the staff and yeah, a lot of times it's restaurants, banks, but sometimes, but now she's doing a lot with the clinics and the hospital, uh, the staff there, be, just so they know this is how you communicate and that's why it's, that's why you can talk to the loved one, uh, you know, and just give respect to the person with dementia, but take the answers from the loved one. <laughs> yeah, and just, yeah. Just, you know, because I, I always tell, we, we did an ultrasound and the gal was very, um, I don't want to say cooperative, understanding is probably a better word. And I said, mm -hmm. I said, is this diagnosis like not front and center of her chart? Because I was like, she was like the third person I'd told in 20 minutes about mom. I'm like, this is stupid. I should not have to tell every single medical professional that we encounter today. They should know. It should be, like I said, it should be front and center. So she said, well, I did read it on her chart. And I'm like, good, finally, somebody's reading it on her chart. And she says, well, we don't normally read that far down on the chart. You know, we're just looking at the, da, da, da. I'm like, this is the most important piece of information that you will need to deal with her. I said, this is very frustrating. I should go into training businesses because taking mm -hmm. mom out, we have, um, like parking lot structures, not structures, but the way the parking lots are laid out, newer parking lots here in California have what they call bioswales. So you pull the car up to the curb and then there's like a, almost like a ravine. Sure. It's to collect oh. groundwater because when it rains, we got to collect it all. <laughs> uh, you know, we, okay. it's California. You're in a desert. Yeah. <laughs> well, Mediterranean, because we're in the, I'm in Northern California, but still, with all the, we had a five year drought, the groundwater table shrank dramatically. So this is a new thing. And it's, it's actually not really conducive to anybody. If you, you want to step across the curb and go over to the other side, it's kind of hazardous. With my mom, we have to walk all the way around and then over to the door. It's like, this parking lot is not set up for somebody with a mobility issue. It's stupid. And I don't have a mobility issue, so it, to me, it's just frustrating, these bio It seems to me like they could put a grates every once in a while or something. Over. I have said that because there's some, you know, I don't, I don't understand this. I drive a Honda Accord. It's not a large car. The car touches almost both sides of the parking space. So if you're parked next to one of these curbs with the bioswale and you get out and you're standing on the curb, if you move wrong, you're going to end up halfway in this ravine, which has got rocks in it, and you're going to break something. Your ankle, your leg, your arm, you know, it's just... Yeah. And my husband used to be a planning commissioner, and I said, these things are a hazard. You got, they got to have grates or something so that there's yeah. something more solid for them to stay on. Now, my mom still wouldn't be able to step into... Oh, man, stepping onto a grate? No. <laughs> <laughs> she would oh. not because she would see I'm not even sure how she'd process a grate with rocks and, and vegetation underneath it, but she would not process it as something stable to stand on. So 
So I would still have to take her the long way and you have to plan ahead. Yeah. Like, Oh, I can't really park there because getting her in and out of the car is not that easy. And you know, it's like, I can't get a handicap sticker cause we don't technically qualify, but ugh, it's a pain in the butt. <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I feel mm -hmm. like educating businesses and companies might might really be a good thing it might be my and next you might path. it might be worthwhile like pursuing that handicap for you i mean handicap under her but you know for, to make it easier for you i would pursue it i think um but as far as your listeners go i was going to say the first book the thing that i think is probably going to be most helpful to them is the exercises that we did religiously to keep george mobile and he was mobile all the way to the end of, uh, well, yeah, pretty much. Mobile. He was able to get in and out of chairs. He was actually getting up and down out of his trike mostly, uh, almost all the way. Um, we did hiking on that trip. We did two and three mile hikes. Um, and a lot of his early symptoms was balance issues. So we did these exercises where we were given them and we did them regularly. And I think it really helped him maintain uh, mobility. And so I've got those in the book, book one, Alzheimer's Tripping with George. So and tell me, second, okay, go ahead. And the second book, the, the thing that I people have told me is most helpful is Dealing with incontinence. I mean, I talk about the layers that I put on the bed <laughs> because it leaks through those paper, you know, it spreads a lot more than those paper pads you put on the bed. And it spreads through their underwear, I mean, the, the diaper. And uh, so it's just a mess. So I talk about that and I also talk about step by step how I dealt with his bowel incontinence. And uh, yeah, I even had pictures in there of the uh, the diapers I used and the handy wipe, the hand wipes I used, and the uh, rubber gloves, things like that. It, just practical stuff. They called me in my support group. They called me the doo doo diva because I that's what I was dealing with. <laughs> I had to become good at it. Yeah. I, I will have to go back because I did, like I said, I started the second book and then the first one came and then all this stuff going on. It's just like, pfft. there's days when it's like, I really should read this. And then like, I can't, I can't do any more Alzheimer's today. Yeah, <laughs> I, have to go, right. I have to go read true crime or something. Yes, um, I understand that. Yeah, that's one of the reasons I started the podcast because there was only so much of these books you could read. You read the 36 hour day. And there's a lot yes. of really great information, but it's heavy. And when, you it's know, heavy the, and it's depressing, I mm, think. Yeah. I think there, yeah, I don't think my book was uplifting for people, they told me, and it was a page turner. So I'm well, glad I'll to have, hear that. I have to get, like, I guess mm -hmm. I have to jump into the, to the first one here. So tell me about some of these adventures that you guys were on. Since I haven't okay. read the first one yet. <laughs> um. We did a lot of hiking and biking. Um, I will tell you about Northern Idaho, the Trike Rally. There's a, on a beautiful trail. You see moose, you see mountains in the distance and swampland in the, in the middle with ponds and lakes. Uh, we encounter moose. Um, it's just a really gorgeous. And then there's other trikers there too. So they, you know, you're, you're riding along and then you stop at a beautiful spot and pretty soon there's like 10 people all there talking about the different trails they've ridden and it's just a nice community. Well, um, I'm, a, I'm a road cyclist so I can relate to that. Yeah. And we, yeah. some of the people in our club have gone to other states and done multiple day bicycle trips. Ah, okay. I have yet to be and, able to get that into my schedule, but it's, I did one for my 50th birthday. I went to Jamaica and did a three-day bike ride across the island. Oh, neat. Yeah, that was great. But then I came home and my dad ended up in the hospital for a month. And then he was home on hospice. And then the beginning of 2017 was horrible. The dog died. My dad, 
my daughter moved out, my dad died, we put my mom in memory care, and that was all before St. Patrick's Day of 2017. So, wow. I, haven't, I haven't had a bicycle trip again, but it's on the it's on all the list. The still is gone from that, huh? You got to go into a room and just remember the gliding through the forest or whatever and over the mountain. Yeah, the heat. <laughs> Yeah, heat. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, being in California, I am not accustomed to humidity, and so I'm looking at the weather, and the weather in Jamaica was pretty similar to the weather we are having here, and I'm like, great. I, when I packed my suitcase, I'm like, okay, on Friday I had the arm warmers and the short sleeve jersey and da 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 da, and I never touched half of that stuff because it was so humid. Ew, don't like yeah. humid. Wow. <laughs> yeah. You wouldn't do well in Florida then. <laughs> nope. We've been to Florida oh. several times. Yeah. But no, yeah. And we went to Atlanta in 2017, and everybody's like, why are you going to Atlanta in June? They're like, are you insane? Yeah. That is when the Rotary International Convention is. Oh. We really lucky because it was only about 60% humidity the week we were there. The week before and the week after was like 90. I'm like, I can deal with 60. So you're a Rotarian as well. Mm -hmm. as well as doing the podcast, as well as caring for your mom, as well as being a photographer. Exactly. It's like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. No wonder you're feeling tired. <laughs> yeah, I need to, I ended up with a flat tire this after, this morning's bike ride, and the friend that changed my tire, he said, your rim strip is dead, so it means the spokes were poking the tire too. Oh, yes. So we changed it. I called my daughter. I said, have you had left the house for work yet? She said, no. And I said, great. Can you just take me home? So I cut it a little short today, which actually worked out to my benefit. <laughs> okay. Well, that was good. Now I just got to take the bike to the shop again and, you know, mm -hmm. see, see how fast he can fix that for me. Uh -huh. So I know when you got home from this, 100 day journey 10,000 mile journey you ended up moving mm -hmm. which sounds like that was a, a not well it sounds like it was kind of a difficult decision yes it was um so that starts out in in the second book after our journey then we continued the journey with alzheimer's and in, enjoying our lives as much as possible um through it, and we really did. We did. We had a lot of great times. Um, one of the things that the lawyer, we went to visit a lawyer and say, "Okay, he's got this diagnosis. What should I be doing? What we should we do with the finances and stuff?" And he said, "You're not rich enough to worry about it." <laughs> Pretty <laughs> much, but uh, yeah. But he did say, uh, "For me to protect my assets, one of the things that." Florida lets you do, and I don't know what other states are, but you, the surviving spouse gets to keep the house. So, um, so we were living in a manufactured home right then, so it didn't have a lot of value. So I moved to a home with some value in town, um, which had easier access to the bike trail too. We didn't have to cross a highway to get to the bike trail, so it been safer. Uh, and so that's what we did. But it was very difficult. I remember one time I'd gone to the new house to meet someone or something, and I'd forgotten something. So we had to rush back in the car and drive back to our old home. And on the way, I had to pull off and pull over and just sob and sob and sob. And I'm crying like that. And George is crying, too. But I don't know if he knows what I'm crying about. But at least he was there to give a hug, you know. <laughs> yeah, so that was so. But it, that's kind of you feel you like you're doing well. You're doing. You're being strong with all these decisions, and then all of a sudden it hits you, and you're you're sobbing. It's just. Uh, I think we uh, we are so busy doing our life that we don't have time to feel, and so every once in a while it just overwhelms. Yeah, I think that's true because I know, especially with doctor visits, it's like leave the rotary meeting, go to mom, you know, deal with that, get here. Do it's just it's like checking off things on a list, which is yeah. I'd much rather would be deal with whatever is going on with her, get her in the car, and go someplace where we can watch kids. 
which she just yeah. loves. I, I have to be careful, and I've said this a lot lately. Sometimes people say, oh, what are you guys going to do today? I'm like, oh, we're going to go watch some kids. And some people that don't <laughs> understand. I had one young man at a restaurant. My husband goes a lot, so we're regulars. And I said that, and he looked at me kind of funny, but I think he was trying really hard not to react like, uh, okay, yeah. do I need to call the police? <laughs> and then I explained to him, I'm like, oh, wait, you don't know. I said, my mom's got advanced Alzheimer's, and being a mom and a grandmother, she really likes to watch the kids. And there's a lot more action at the pool <laughs> than there is at the park. Yeah. So, but of course now it's, you know, the kids are all in school. So I do things like take her to the fabric store because she used to sew. She used to be an excellent seamstress. And, um, you know, the problem is, is she, she's at, I don't know if it's a stage or just part of her personality, but she always wants to make sure that, you know, but now you're doing what you need to do, right? And and don't worry about me. And, you know, it's like, we're doing this for you. <laughs> I've learned to say, oh, no, 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 this is exactly what I want to do. Yeah, sit in the park and watch kids. No, but that's okay. So we go to the fabric store and just feel the different fabrics. We look at the different fabrics. I don't have to worry about the floor being a different texture or levels. And it just gives her, it gets her out of the memory care and, it gives us something to do that's not sitting, you know, not sitting in her room with her asking me, so what have you been up to lately? And I've, now she gets this, it's like a breath and a body position. And I know that question's coming. So I usually can cut her off and say, ask her, well, what have you been up to lately? You know, what's going on around here? Which I always get, well, no, same old, same old or not much. And it's like, okay, so much for that answer. <laughs> But because so she doesn't know, because she thinks I'm her best friend, if I actually give her answers, like, oh, I just came from Rotary, or I've been photographing the high school graduates, you know, the seniors, it's like, it confuses her, because it's like, but that's not what you do, that's what this other, it's, so I just, I give her mm. super basic answers, because if you confuse her, sometimes it turns a little bit negative. And I don't um, need that. So no. did George remember who you were up to the end or did he end up getting you confused with somebody else? We were sitting at the dining room table. Uh, he was very quiet. Uh, this was probably three or four months before he passed. Uh, so we were still riding our trikes. We were still socializing with people. He was still smiling a lot um we would go dancing now his idea of dancing is just standing there and swaying side to side but you know we would do that um but we were sitting at the table and we were having lunch i think and he kept on looking out the front window and kept on looking and kept on looking and i says what are you looking for and he says i'm waiting for my wife to come home and i said oh and i says well that's nice <laughs> That's nice. Yeah, I didn't want to. I didn't want to correct him. I just let it be. Uh, later on, I was out in the garage doing something. I came back in and said, "I'm home." <laughs> <laughs> well, that's awesome because I know a lot of people. It hits them so it's so sudden like that that it's it's impossible yeah. not to react negatively because it's like I had one guest who brought mom dinner on a tray in her room. The tray hit the floor. She went running in there and she said, and, and mom was like, you know, Sandy didn't come home from school today. That was the name of the, her daughter who was an oh. adult. And she said, but mom, I'm Sandy. And she says, I know, but I want little Sandy. And I thought, oh, I'm glad my mom thinks I'm her best friend. <laughs> yeah. That just sounds, I don't know how you navigate that kind of trauma mentally. You know, and, it's just, and it, she literally said, my mom forgot who I was in 10 minutes. And, so it's and, like, she, and, it, and it can come back and it goes and it comes back. And that's the hard part is, I think, as a caregiver or somebody who loves somebody with dementia, is you grieve that they're gone. And then they have a good day or a good few moments. And you're like, oh, maybe I was mistaken. Or, you know, you fall in love again. And then they're gone again so then you have to grieve all over again it's just 
And that is very difficult. It's, it's a roller coaster, and yeah, it gets sick. <laughs> That's probably harder for caregivers like you who take care of a spouse versus adult children caregivers like my sister yes. and I, because yes. obviously I don't expect to, uh, my mom to outlive me. God forbid. And it is very difficult, but there was one day we'd come back from watching the kids and she says, I had such a nice time. I appreciate it so much. I love you. And I was like, Whoa, okay. And that was a great day. And then there's other days when she's poking every one of my buttons and yeah. I have to, I have to remember the day that she said, you know, cause she hasn't remembered who I am in forever. I haven't heard. I love you. She doesn't like to be physical. She doesn't want to hold my hand or lock elbows. Oh, oh she's terrible. She's going to fall on her face. It's yeah. inevitable because she will not allow help. And if I force is kind of the wrong word, but almost force it, insist, I guess is the right word. Like, you know, it was hotter than heck out here. And she's trying to step from the curb into the parking lot, which is, you know, five, six inches. No, it's about four or five inches down. So it's not difficult and her mm -hmm. her balance is fine it's just like i said her visual processing is shot she's re i'm like i reach out a hand I'm like oh here you know i'll help you and she's like eh. and she's about to lean on this hot car next to her and i just grabbed her hand i'm like don't lean on that car it's hot you know so and then as soon as she stepped into the party i was like literally two steps down she jerks her hand out of mine and says that's all that's enough I'm like okay at least you didn't burn yourself on the car <laughs> it was like a hundred degrees and I didn't know wow, how long the card was so sitting hard. there. It's a challenge, but yeah, you know, you're trying to be so sweet and so good and she's just not cooperating. <laughs> no, she doesn't. It's very frustrating. <laughs> um, yeah, I've had people say, well, why don't you get her a walker? I'm like, well, cause I should probably, one, she probably wouldn't use it. She'd leave it somewhere. So I think that would actually just be more issues. It's not a balance. It's just she's concerned about falling, so she watches her feet, which is a great way to fall. And because, like, my husband and I were in Denver back in September, and we were coming down some cement stairs outside the Red Rock um, Audit Amphitheater. It's a beautiful mm -hmm. place. And the sunlight was coming through the handrail, and it was throwing these really cool shadows on the steps. But I looked down, I'm like, if my mom was here, she would not move. Because even yeah. for me, it was confusing where the edge of the step was because the shadows yeah. were on an angle and they were like a crisscross pattern. It was really cool. And I'm mad at myself that I didn't take a photo of it because it's the perfect example of what you're seeing and what you know is the case are not the same. And I know... Yeah she would not have been able to navigate it because it took me a second. And I'm like, I'll just do better if I just look straight ahead out at the horizon and just, you know, step down, step down because stairs are pretty even and we're not, you know, we don't have to worry about it, but yeah, it was, it was crazy. So that's what happens uh, with her is what she's seen is not what her brain is seeing. So yes, it's, right. it's, it's, right. it's a challenge and it's, mm -hmm. I'm very aware of how our communities are definitely not set up for senior citizens, people with, you know, mobility issues. You know, like I said, I don't have any of those problems. My knees are creaky, but other than that, I don't have issues. And so it's, mm -hmm. it's a challenge. Yes. You said, um, there was something I was going to say, and then we veered off in another direction. <laughs> I don't to know, but I, you know, I, I saw on your website that you have had people talking about, end of life issues and looking at the end of life differently and um because you're facing this thing with this mass on your mom's kidney and she has this diagnosis and she's in the late stages this is this is a tough and i've seen other people weigh this too like he's got a heart problem are we going to have surgery even though he's got dementia and those are tough decisions for the caregiver very tough. i was very fortunate in that george was healthy in every other way so um, i didn't mom, have to deal with that but i saw a lot of people going through it my mom was physically healthy and she still is for the most part but whatever's going on with this growth next to her kidney which you know they want to do a biopsy and i'm very concerned about 
putting her and putting her under anesthesia because mm -hmm. it's a brain. It, the chemicals change your brain. That's how you block the yeah. pain. And the neurologist said, and I believe her about 80%. She says when the mom returns to where she was at, once the chemicals wear off, but the issue could speed up the decline. Well, I know from previous conversations with my mom, well, one, she'd kill us if she knew where she, if she was, if she had a comprehension of where she was at, where she's living, how she's living, the fact that she fights with the hairdresser to, you know, she's telling the hairdresser not to cut her hair or trim her nails. And it's the whole reason you're there lady. And she doesn't comb her hair the way she used to. And she has to have somebody help her with the shower. She would want to be gone is what exactly. But it's still really like, you almost feel like, you know, it's now it's on me. If I'm like, well, we're not going to do anything about this kidney mass. And if she has kidney failure, okay, fine. That's what killed our dad. Uh -huh. But then again, it just, uh, it is very hard because I'm not, I know it's the right thing in my mind, but my heart is yeah. like, hmm. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's a challenge. And you're also thinking about, thinking about the public looking in uh, and how, at these decisions as well. I think we, uh, we do things in a community and uh, so we know we are under the spyglass or not yeah, necessarily scrutiny. spyglass, but scrutiny. Yeah. People um, aren't in our shoes and it's, and it's, you know, they don't know the tough decision that's being made and, and different people have different backgrounds, different religious beliefs. And so it's, it's hard to make a decision and try to please your mom or the spirit of your mom. Yeah. Uh, or where she was before. And, um, and society at all, at, as a whole. Yeah. Well, then I question, it's like, well, should I have told all her, her two brothers and her sister that, you know, it's like, I thought we had a bladder infection and now we're facing this much bigger deal. And it's like, oh, I guess maybe I should have told all these people. None of them call me. None of them check in on me. Her sister does go and visit as often as she can. She's not far away, but she's not close. And um, mm -hmm. somebody totaled the car. We gave her my dad's car and it got totaled. It wasn't her fault which is a surprise. Um, so she has to have somebody drive her and it's probably 40 minutes at least. If you don't yeah, run that's into a any big traffic. challenge. That's a yeah. Big it's not challenge. like she can just jump on a bus and go see her sister. It was one of the reasons we gave her the car was so that she would have that mobility. And she took care of her mom, my grandmother and mm -hmm. They lived on grandmother's social security. So when my grandmother died, my aunt ended up destitute. And I'm like, what the heck? Why did they, why did you other three siblings allow that? Now my dad was dealing with my mom's, the beginning of my mom's disease. So I, I can see where his decision was logical, but I'm not sure it was a hundred percent right. They, they all needed to have gotten together and make a better decision. So none of these guys call mm -hmm. me. So I figured, you know what? I'm not, gonna allow other people to question the decision i am the healthcare provider power of attorney not provider there's a reason my dad made me the healthcare power of attorney and not jointly with anybody else i don't like to make the decisions but i i know he did it because i was like him and i'm i can i can be a little bit more pragmatic and more logical i can mm -hmm. i can kind of close the door on the heart a little bit, but it's, it's not easy. Cause I had to sign the no. paperwork for hospice for my dad. And that felt, that felt bad. And I knew exactly I was doing what he wanted. <laughs> yeah. So it's, yeah, it does yeah, feel it's, bad. I kind of figured Alzheimer's would take her, but now I don't know. Yeah. And we thought the, the beginning of 2019, the neurologist said, if nothing else happens, pneumonia, or any other disease, your mom could easily live 10 more years. My mom is only 76 at this point. She's almost 77. And um, now I don't think that's the case. Mm -hmm. And I know she wouldn't want that. So yeah, it's like, I feel like all the time you're always having to make decisions for them and for you. And it's, it's really, that's the hardest part. I think try to balance their needs and your needs. And you're the one that's living and going to continue yes. to live 
but you and know, all the training yeah all the training I got just said it's all about you the caregiver you have to take care of you and it was it was hard because you're used to um, it, it was hard making me the priority when there's so much else calling on you but you gotta you gotta do it um, I think they say that that's a lot even, because caregivers don't take care of themselves and then they're hospitalized or they die before the person they're taking care of and now there's yeah. even a bigger problem yes um, yes we never discussed what would happen with my mother if my dad died first and he had a lot of chronic illnesses so him going first was was completely foreseeable it should not mm -hmm. have been a surprise it should not have been a panic situation and i look back and i think what the heck like, why did we not have this conversation? If something happens to me, this is what I think you guys need to do with your mother. But that never happened. So, yeah. you know, that, that still yeah. baffles me. He assumed she was going to come live with me. I'm like, oh, no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> like, my husband and I are self-employed. That means we have flexibility. But just there's times when it's like, how come all the flexibility is going to the clients? My schedule's getting just obliterated here but no you guys are happy that's okay you know that's how it is sometimes and other times it's yes like, oh, i could take a longer bike ride on wednesday or friday morning and it's okay yeah and other days i have to do a quick you know 15 mile loop mm -hmm. and go home and shower and get my day started it's just the way it works you know i cannot imagine what would happen i know what would happen to my life it wouldn't have lasted very long with my mother living with me Mm -hmm. And I knew she needed the stimulation of the activities that she doesn't participate in. Although she does go on the bus. They take little bus tours around town. I maybe they must get her on the bus somehow. <laughs> well, <laughs> she's like I said, she's physically capable. And, and she's getting up those stairs. <laughs> yeah. It was earlier this year. For whatever reason, they went on a bus ride on a Monday, and I show up, and they're like, oh, your mom's on the bus. And I'm like, what? <laughs> She's doing what? And I'm like, do we know when they're going to be back? Because I'm here, and I could go home and do some stuff, but then I'm not coming back the rest of the week. The rest of the week is busy. And uh -huh. they're like, oh, they should be back, you know, about 30 minutes. I'm like, okay, I'll go. I'm getting really good at answering emails on my phone. Yeah. <laughs> which I don't like uh -huh. to do, but. Yeah. I made the, yeah, I, I'm getting better at it, yeah. and I made good use of that 30 minutes, and she came back, and she was happy, and we had a nice visit, and I was like, okay, but I guess she does that every week, or she, I'll have to ask again, so it's been, yeah. it's been a few months since that, and um, you had asked about uh, us doing bicycle trips overnight, and I just wanted to get back to that, is so when we retired, we semi-retired in 2008. We rode our bikes around Wisconsin carrying all our camping equipment. And uh, we were on the road 40 days. And then in 2014, we were in the process of selling our business, which was very, very stressful. And we had an, another offer, <laughs> finally. And one of the things that happens is they give you an offer for your business, and then it's... Uh, period of time when they're doing all this investigation and all they need is paper burden. That's what that sounds like you've got a whoopee cushion. There. Yeah, I'm like my water <laughs> bottle is being rude. <laughs> so then we uh, we rode from northern Illinois down to Florida on our trikes. That's a, that's a distance. And he was already showing symptoms at that time. He was not diagnosed. I knew he had the illness, uh, but I uh, could not get him diagnosed because it would devalue. We looked like desperate sellers. Aha. Uh -huh. <laughs> my my mom refused to do some of the, I don't know why doctors don't do the most definitive test first. It's like, let's yeah. do all these other tests. She got to a point where she had a neuropsychologist say, oh, you're fine. Even my daughter, who was 16 at the time, knew that was baloney. Yeah. I call it my mail order MD. And <laughs> so she was like, see, I'm fine. And it's like, oh, no, you're not. So she was actually not diagnosed until 
September of 2011. And by that point, it was like, yeah, duh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It takes, you know, it's a, like, it but takes that such was, a long time. Yeah, but that was a lot on her, not, well, I mean, the one neuropsychologist didn't think she had a problem, but she was still early enough. This was, I th must have been 2008. It was still early enough in the disease. It was easy for her to bluff people. I think she yeah. bluffed herself. So did, did being together nonstop for 40 days, did that make it more obvious what was going on with him? Um, no, because we worked together uh, in the business. Um, in fact, in 2011, uh, he refused to go back up and work on the business uh, that was failing. And so we turned the business over to me as owner and president. Um, and we, then he would go back up because I was going. <laughs> <laughs> so we went up back up to Wisconsin and we worked on the business. And I could tell when we were working on the business every day. I mean, I, I just, I started getting smarter than him and that was never the case before. <laughs> he was always a smart one. But I would see things that needed to be done. I would see uh, engineering flaws and he wouldn't see them and that wasn't, that wasn't normal. And then he started calling customers more than once a day with the same phone call, you know, saying, you guys got anything for us? Da, da, da. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's not. Yeah, we went kind of through a similar thing. My parents and I had a photography studio and film processing lab. We also had a digital processor at the end. Because obviously we know that the turn of the 2000s film was starting to go away. And this one day, this client called me. Well, she called. She got me on the phone, and it was just <laughs> F-bombs and coming unglued. And I was like, whoa, what the heck? And she was oh so frustrated with my mom because she would tell my mom, this was a family portrait. The mom client had braces, and she, would, she wanted them digitally removed, which is, I send that off because it's mm -hmm. way not worth it's, I think it's 10 bucks to have it done. Oh, I can't yeah. make it look good for 10 bucks. So <laughs> I just send it off. But my mom fussed and fussed and fussed with it because it's not an easy thing to do. I'm sure the retouching company has a trick that we didn't know. Mm -hmm. And there was other requests that were probably very normal, but my mom kept forgetting them. And it was like, oh, okay, well, here you go. No, that's still not right. Oh, okay, let me fix that. Okay, here you go. No, it's still not right. So I think we must have gone through three or four of those. And when that day when the client called, I said, you tell me exactly what you've been telling mom. I will make sure it gets done right. And it did. She, once my parents retired in 2005, I had already broken off partly. I had started the business on our side of the mountain in two like about 18 months earlier because I knew they were going to retire I knew I wasn't going to keep that retail location because it was expensive so I was establishing the business in my hometown and this gal came two or three times after that and her kids aged out you know they get they grow up and <laughs> mom can't yeah. bring them together for a family portrait now that they're 35 <laughs> so I I managed to, to salvage that one but that was that was the challenge for me yeah. is I had to make sure that I knew what she was telling people, which isn't always easy if I'm talking to somebody or I'm photographing somebody. It was it was stressful. I was not I was concerned about them retiring because I knew it gave her a purpose, which we all need. And you know, it, it made her feel good, but the stress on me was not fun and the clients didn't need the stress either. So, yeah. and then That's tough, yeah. in looking back now, she used to, they lived like literally less than a mile away. She would show up about 30 to 40 minutes after I did. I was 30, 20 miles away. She would sweep the walk and wash the front glass doors. And it's like, could we like get to work in here? <laughs> but I had just let her do what she needed to do. And it dawned on me just actually kind of recently that she would start working on orders when it was quieter. And I think uh -huh. it was because sometimes with the phone ringing, the doorbell ringing, even if you're not having to deal with those, just that noise and the machine noise, I think it was easier for her to actually work 
on nothing was that complicated, but the more complicated than sweeping type things mm -hmm. later on because it was a half hour, 40 minutes for me to get home and she waits till we're almost closed to get started. I'm like, can we start work on that tomorrow? Because I got to go home and feed the kid. <laughs> but I think, I think it was her, I think it was a coping technique that I didn't recognize until just kind of recently. Yeah. Hindsight's 2020. Yeah. yeah. And I've talked to other guests who've said, you know, always take a spouse or even an adult child with you to the doctor because they can attest to things that, you know, if you're having memory issues, you don't know what you're forgetting. And one guest, she traveled a lot for business. Her husband was also their second marriage, traveled a lot for business. So they weren't together for multiple days at a time. And they went on a trip for two weeks. And he was like, holy Toledo what is going oh. on with her because she was re repetitive asking the same questions it was so obvious but if they had not taken that trip and he had not gone with her to doctor appointments after that who knows how long it would have taken her to be diagnosed yeah. and she's younger she's younger onset alzheimer's and she's mm -hmm. doing everything recommended to maintain where she's at and i talked to her in it was April, early April of 2018. I saw her in February of 2019. Now, it's the only two times I've seen this woman. I recognized her, and I was shocked that she recognized me, remembered who I was. I don't know that she remembered my name, but that's okay. I can't remember names to save my soul. There's nothing to do with my, my memory. <laughs> Just It's always been the case. She remembered about the podcast, which I do have a t-shirt that has my hashtag on it. So it was a little trick, but it's like, you've only seen me twice and I didn't have this shirt when we met the first time. So whatever she's doing seems to be working. You know, she uh -huh. was, we were at the state Capitol with our state advocacy day. So I was, I was a little apprehensive. I didn't approach her cause I didn't want to be like, Oh, Hey, you remember me? Cause that's not nice. <laughs> But she saw me, we ended up like standing next to each other and she was like, oh, hi, how's it going? And I actually was very shocked that she remembered me, which was a nice feeling, but mm -hmm. it's, it's definitely, there's a lot of things you can do to keep the levels going. Like you said, the exercises, riding your bikes, hiking, all of that stuff had to have helped him a lot. And you. Yes. And me for sure. Yes. Relieving stress. Um, one thing about biking, and you know this, is it's not only exercise, but you're out in nature, and you're socializing, mm -hmm. which is usually biking with other people, and all three of those things we got when we went for a bike ride, it just really helped us maintain our social life throughout. So many people that are caregivers become isolated when they're caregiving for their spouse, um, so this, this helped us maintain a social life. In the second book, um, I do outline how the bike group came forward for us when he started to slow down on his trike and we couldn't keep up with the group anymore. They all came together and we got him on a, we got an electric assist tandem. It was oh, a fun. community effort. And we were able to keep riding with the group up to the end of the day before he passed. He was riding on the back of that tandem. Awesome. I did not know they made electric assist tandems. Um, it was a hodgepodge. It was um, two oh, so tricycles. Like yeah, with that I'll have uh, the two wheels in back and one wheel in front. But it was recumbent. The, your pedals are out in front of you. And um, so you take the front wheel off the back trike and you hook it onto the back of the front trike. And then we put the motor on the front trike so i had to do the gizmos but he didn't have to worry about it you know he didn't have to learn the electric assist so, it was so kind he of could just ride along every once in a while he'd pedal and uh, <laughs> that's awesome so it was a franken bike yes that's cool and, and you know because we triked for so many years what really blows my mind and this is kind of, you've seen this in other things that people do a lot of that they're able to continue doing that even when everything else is gone, like piano playing. Mm -hmm. Well, he would 
hardly be able to walk. We'd shuffle up to the trike. I just wait patiently, and then he'd lift one foot up, and it was about a foot and a half, two feet off the ground. He'd have to lift his foot up over the trike in order to sit down, and he'd be able to do that. It was hmm. just amazing. That is really cool. Yeah. Well, those bicycle groups are great, great company. I can attest yes. to that. <laughs> yes, they are a great company. Healthy, fun-loving. They like to think positive. It really helps. Yeah, I was uh, appreciating the beautiful weather this morning, and one of our cycling friends said, well, it's getting kind of windy, and I'm like, I'm just going to appreciate that it's not hot and it's not cold. There was a couple times when it's like, okay, this wind can just quit. Yeah, because <laughs> it's like, why is it pushing me backwards? I hate that. <laughs> uh, not that's. I mean, I'm a strong rider, but I need to lose about twenty pounds. That would help a lot. And you know, it's like I'm like getting further and further behind the slower group. I'm like, whatever. I'm just gonna keep uh -huh. going. Not gonna yeah. even worry about it. And it does. Right. It really. If I do not do my workout routine, which is six days, six mornings a week, wow, you don't want to deal with me. I, I get very grumpy ah. and just tired and grouchy and just unpleasant. And that's like, no, we don't need that. So yeah. I, a lot yeah. of people I think probably feel like, well, this chick does not do anything until after lunch. Like, no, I actually do. I just don't do anything that with clients or guests because I'm not dressed nice. <laughs> <laughs> I'm at the gym or at, out riding my bike or whatever. Yeah. Okay. So you have, the audio version of your book is coming out. Oh, I'm so excited. The, uh, the audio actress for the first book is Robin Siegerman. She's an, a voice actress. Well, she's a regular actress, but um, she does this voice uh, recordings. And I've got the, I got the draft of it. So I'm going through it to make sure she didn't mispronounce anything. And I'm in chapter seven and it's just, I couldn't have read it better. She did such a good job. It's just amazing. And and she has a great voice, and she's doing George's voice lower and, and uh, getting the emotion in there. It's just awesome. I love it. Awesome. And That's, then that comes out I also when? hired some. That comes out, well, it'll be out in October. Okay. Yeah. And then the, the uh, audio book. For the second book is also being recorded as we speak. This actress is, is doing a good job too. Um, I didn't use the same one because she was going to be busy past my launch date for my second book. My launch, second book is out in paperback, but I'm actually launching it officially on December 4th. Okay. I wanted to make sure we got those year. dates in there. Yeah, December 4th, and then we're going to have a big party. <laughs> and... Um, uh, let me see. Oh, and then we're going to do large print and audiobook and Kindle. Awesome. Launching on that date. So. It's a little um, different than publishing was 25 years ago. Yes. <laughs> Very <laughs> different. It's a lot of work. <laughs> I believe it. Yeah. Now, are you part of the All's Authors? Yes, I am. Okay, I thought so. Yeah. I, most of my authors are, but I try to make sure I connect any of them that aren't. Because that's such yeah. a great organization. Yeah, it is. And I've got over 200, I think, authors now with Alzheimer's stories. A lot of them are children's books or, I mean, they're all different venues. Caring for parents, um, like Ann Campanella's is a multi-layered with her miscarriage and the animal therapy. And it's just all it was a great story as well. Yeah, I talked to her. Well, I talked to a whole bunch of all's authors December of 2018. So those all got released early in 2019. And she was, I think one of the, I think she was the very first one because I think I talked oh, okay. to her and then I emailed her and said, Hey, is there any other authors you could introduce me to? And then my email blew up. <laughs> like, oh my goodness. <laughs> I mean, it was almost immediate. And since you know I'm on the West coast, a lot of times I send out emails towards the end of my day and so uh -huh. I don't hear back for a day or so, which is fine. I get it. You know, I, I don't worry about it. And it was, I swear, she had to be sitting at her computer too, because it was almost immediate. And it was like, oh, here you go. Boom, boom. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, thank you. And, and then, of course, because it was 
I think it was right around Thanksgiving. So it was like, we're getting into the holiday time. These people are going to be busy. I think I did one author every day for a week. Wow. <laughs> like, and then they're like, when is this coming out? I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> Just put them all in the bank. <laughs> I don't have to stress over the holidays. Yeah, there you go. Which last year, Christmas was on a Tuesday, which is when the show comes out. So New Year's Day was a Tuesday. So it was like, okay, that was this is my second year that I'm into now. So I had to navigate all that. I was like, oh my gosh, this is crazy. You know, and caregivers never get a day off. So I try never to take a week off with the podcast. I've only taken one week off and that was the 4th of July week, 2018. So chugging along. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. It's, wow. It's, um, I, I, it's hard to do the, um, I had a message up on my screen that said an internet was, um, uh, internet was unstable so i hope that didn't jumble but anyway what was i going to say oh i know i'm blogging uh, i continue to blog um after i published the books and about my life after george and um just i'm exploring different things now as a as a single woman just um, doing camping right now i'm traveling and doing all kinds of stuff to um, see what I like, see what my future life is going to be like. Well, I'll have to touch base with you again in about six months, maybe, maybe a little more and see. Yeah. I'll, I'll keep up with the blog and when you've had enough new experiences, I'll, I'll reach out again and we'll find out because I haven't talked to anybody <laughs> that much about what it's like afterwards. Ah, that so is a, uh, it's, a, it's a transition because you have, your life is so full and so stressful that when all of a sudden it's over, you have to find a venue uh, for your activity. That's probably why there's so many Al's authors out there. <laughs> they start writing. That's true. <laughs> and publishing. <laughs> that is true. I never thought of it that way. But no, that's yeah. a, and then I would think it would be easy to, get depressed and, and kind of go a negative path. So I'm glad you're not doing that. And obviously you could be an inspiration for people after the journey on Alzheimer's, how to, I don't want to say piece your life back together, but kind of, I don't know. I'm not sure what the you right got to think about it before that happens. I mean, I'm sure you have been, you know, caring for your mom for 20 years and going, Oh, and you're probably sometimes dreaming about, well, if I didn't have to spend this time, what would I be doing with it? So I, I did. I dreamt about what I, my life would be like when I wasn't caregiving. Of course, I didn't do any of that, but <laughs> you, you fantasize. You try to get out of that space of what was me and I... I'm tired <laughs> and go, well, okay, it's not going to be forever. And someday I'm going to be able to go to the Netherlands, which I did. Oh, fun. Uh, in May of this year. Yeah. So My husband is very determined to buy real estate in Jamaica. He is a real estate broker. So it's like, I want, uh -huh. I want a place where we can go and get away from winter or whatever, which I know, can hear you guys laughing now. I know you don't think California gets winter. <laughs> it's winter for me. <laughs> I've, I've glo I lived here. I'm a multi generational Californian, which we're kind of like a unicorn. Not too many people that can say that. Um, I would love to go to Jamaica when it's wet and cold out, so that's okay. But you know, he talks about that, and I kind of look at him because I can't imagine him being happy on an island for too much extended time mm. but he also says well i know we can't do that until after mom and so that's kind mm. of one of the phrases we use is after mom and when we were looking at another yeah. 10 years it's like yeah that's gonna put us almost her age yeah. and now that it might yeah. not be that long it's like okay well now i kind of feel bad that we had those conversations but uh, it's <laughs> yeah yeah right you do you feel you feel guilty but it... i don't know just yeah, it's where the hard. mind goes. Yeah. Yeah, you yeah. it's it's a challenge and unfortunately it's a challenge more people will probably be facing in the next yeah. couple of decades. 
I just talked yeah. to somebody about the Alzheimer's walk yesterday. So that'll be, that was very interesting. What, how that, how the Alzheimer's walks fund the research and everything. So mm -hmm. I'm doing that the first time yeah. this year. So, oh, okay. So do you think there's any more books in your future? Yes, I already have the blogs up uh, for my trip from Illinois down to Florida. I think I'll write about that and getting to a diagnosis, which was a long journey. And, uh, and then, I don't know, and then I might write about what life is like afterwards. <laughs> this exploration I, I'm doing. I think that's a good, good book topic. Be like I said, because I don't think, I think people... You're so tired and so I think I think the emotions of when they're gone are so confusing. I think it's hard to know how to move forward. So I think that's a good topic you can help people through. Mm -hmm. So you got some work cut out for you. <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> well, I look forward to finishing the books that I've started and reading more about your blog and connecting again in 2020 and see where you're at and good luck okay. with the Kindle audio versions, large print and oh, launch of the excited. second book. Yes. The, the blog is at susanstraley.com. So awesome. That will be in the yeah, show notes. You can just scroll okay. down and hit the hot link and go there. And after you're done listening, you can have tons of stuff to read. <laughs> All righty. Well, I don't want to take right. up any more of your time. I appreciate this, and I look forward to chatting with you again. Again. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you. You're welcome. Have a good evening. Bye.